All right, everybody. Good afternoon. How are we doing today? Fantastic. Well, yes? Good. Splendid. I like it. All right, welcome, welcome. Okay, today we're going to start with a poetry warm up. We're going to present two more of our advertisement analyses, and then we're going to introduce, with a little bit of pre writing, uh, our fourth quarter novel unit, The Great Gatsby. My personal favorite novel of all time, but uh, we'll get all into that. Before we get to the poetry warm up, I'm going to hand you out uh, a question I want you to think about. Okay, hello? this question now and I'll collect this from you in about a half hour and the question on the slip okay I want you to read this starter and fill in according to your own experience your own experience and your own memories of your own lives it goes a little something like this in my younger and more vulnerable years my blank gave me some advice that I've been turning over in my mind ever since okay now I want you to think about who that blank who would fit in there mother father sibling friend if you can't think of anything else, maybe you got some good advice from a movie or a TV show or from a book. Okay, anywhere you got a really good piece of advice when you were younger, I want you to think about what the source of that advice was and write that down in the blank. And then I want you to actually complete what I've started for you here. It says, whenever blankety blank, comma, just remember that blankety blank, period. Okay? So. I want you to just be thinking about that, and I'll, I'll collect this from you in about eh, half hour, something like that, okay? Yes? Can I change up the words a little bit? You can change it up a little bit if you feel the need, yes, okay? Yes. Everybody have one? Yes? Okay. So work on that, just be thinking about that, all right? And I'll get them from you uh, in a few minutes. Okay, now... Um, Poetry warm up. Let's see, Brittany. Okay, you haven't gone yet, right? No. So let's let's hear uh, a poem that you have prepared to discuss. Um, let's go to our poets.org website that we all went to. Okay. Yours was an occasion or a theme. Uh, okay. The occasion. And what was the occasion? Um, gun violence. Gun violence. Okay. Or, wait a minute. Uh, maybe it was. Maybe it was a theme. Maybe it was theme. Okay, let's look at theme. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Okay. <clears throat> All right. And here's going a tad slowly today, but it should load. Okay. What is the name of your poem? Um, Trigger Guard. Trigger Guard. Okay. Let's just sort of browse these. Wow. Titles themselves are very evocative, aren't they? Okay. Wow. Okay. Huh. That one's just called Hoodie. Wow. Okay. All right, in a minute here, I'll just search it up. But here it is. I saw it. Trigger Guard by Joanna Frick, 2010. Okay. 
So we actually just had the, um, the 20th anniversary of Columbine. You guys familiar with what happened? Yeah, 1999. Um, Would you mind, Brittany, just reading this for us, and I'll scroll as you read, and then we'll hear what you had to say about why you chose it, and then anybody else can chime in about it as well, okay? Trigger guard, Joanna Furman. Everyone I ever loved was standing on a platform with a gun. In the cartoon version, a spy pops up with the word bang. Ah. In the soap opera version, my face turns to color Merlot. Merlot, it's a kind of Merlot. wine. Yes. In the haiku version, metal gleams in the narrow shadow. In the Republican version, two villains drop themselves in a single flag. In the Lion Co. version, idolatry yucks. <coughs> Paradigm. Yeah, this line is really odd. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but poetry can get unpredictable and, and crazy without warning. In my diary version, I wonder, okay, honestly, I don't think this is the poem that I think it is. Really? Yeah, can you, hold, can you scroll down a little bit? Yeah. So I don't think that's the right time. Chekhov was a Russian playwright. Go ahead. In the 10 o'clock news version, the crisis of violence is rising. In the action film version, a shot means profit for William. In the catalog version, the smoke's hue is a burnished moss. In the teen movie version, a nerdy gun removes her glasses. In the lucid dream version, a kiss is a kiss. I kiss a muzzle and it blooms. In the music video version, a gun turns into a mouth. Oh, that's it. And that's it. Okay. What's happening in this poem? What did, what did you write about your reaction to it? Um, I said it gives examples of how gun violence necessarily isn't the guy's fault, but like society is kind of, as we're exposed to it, like in cartoons or soap operas or like music videos and stuff like that. That's great. What are some other ways that you can think of that we're exposed to, and we're not here to argue about we should have gun control. I don't really want it to turn into that. Let's just appreciate the expression for what it is. We don't have to agree or disagree with it necessarily. Um, but what are some other ways that we're exposed to guns a lot from a very, very early age? Nerf guns, yeah. Okay. Now we place them into the hands of very, very small kids. You know, um, it's kind of fascinating how. And have we talked about this in here before? I feel like maybe we touched on it. Yeah, it's almost like it's a throwback to when we were more warlike in our, like primordial times, maybe when we had to fight for territory and you know we had to fight for every scrap of survival. Uh, maybe it's still sort of in us that we have to train ourselves for combat somehow, like it just sort of in our DNA somehow. Uh, so we just sort of give kids guns and things without even thinking about why are we doing this. Yes. Sure. Okay. Um, and then of course there's, and I know we've talked about what's the big hobby that a lot of teenagers love that have to do with video games. Yeah. Video games, I mean, you know, it's the vicarious sort of like, you're not really shooting them, but you are pretend shooting them, and you know. So, um, that second one, the cartoon version with the flag bang, like the Bugs Bunny cartoons, I mean, yeah. Um, all these different, like, what technique is the writer using? What technique is she using? The entire poem, it almost started to get a little, how did it start to feel? Repetition, exactly. It started to become like this, well, why might she have used that technique? Any, any theories? What's the effect of that constant repetition? 
hammering away. The problem won't go away. Yeah. Every time you turn your head, every time you get to a new stanza, you're expecting something different, maybe, but nope, you just get more of the same. Even though you're looking somewhere else, all right, boom. Why don't you all, let's do this. Turn this on this blank side. Turn on the blank side. Okay. All right. Why don't you just write Why don't you add your own couplet? Add your own couplet. Just fill that in. Fill that in in your own way. As if you were as if Joanna asked us all to contribute two lines. We want to keep the poem going, 25 more lines. What would you, how would you add to that? Okay? Mm -hmm. And I'll put hers back on. Okay? Alright, I already know mine. Well, what do you think, guys? Um, okay. Um, all these different contexts, uh, a cartoon, in a soap opera, in a poem, uh, in a political ideology. Lang Po, I don't know Lang Po. You want to look it up real quick? Let's look it up. I, I don't know that word. Does anybody know Lang Po? in poetry sort of combined into one word, I guess. Okay. Uh, in my diary version, look at this one. That one is chilling. That makes that sends a shiver down my back because that looks like something maybe an active shooter person might have felt or written at one point in a diary. I mean, that's kind of chilling, right? Uh, okay. Uh, guns are everywhere in movies. They're everywhere in movies. Some of the most popular movies of all time feature guns, you know. Anything by Quentin Tarantino, The Godfather, you know. Um, Shrek. Shrek did not have guns. Did it not? Shrek did not have guns. Okay, Shrek did not have guns. Well argued. Not all, not all films. <laughs> all right. Chekhov is a Russian playwright, so if you pull a random thing off the shelf, it's a Russian play, you know. Apparently, she's assuming we, we know. Well, we don't already know. But, but with her knowledge, she must know Chekhov plays. We don't. Um, in the 10 o'clock news version, well, that's an obvious one. Okay. In the action film version, a shot means profits are rolling. Okay, so she's commenting. What do you think she's commenting on there? You know, action movies are big money, so the more guns, the more explosions and bright, shiny objects. Like, gun. What's that? Michael Bay, okay. Uh, in the catalog version, what might, what might that be a reference to? 
gun catalog. A gun catalog. Yeah. Okay. It's a big business, the sale of guns. Uh, in a teen movie version. Now this is like personifying the gun in a strange, surreal sort of way. Um, what's that? Can you tell me Scooby Doo like whatever like takes on the glass. Yeah. Yeah, okay, it's Velma and Scooby Doo. This is great, Colin. Uh, takes off her glasses and suddenly she's now sexy or something, right? That whole bit. Um, so she's commenting here maybe on maybe she's commenting here on, well, there's a certain sexiness or appeal about the guns. You know, uh, you're cool if you have one, or you're tough if you have one, or something like that. Uh, um, this is just her having a dream. And this one is an odd, chilling ending to it, okay? A gun turns into a mouth, which means it can now communicate, I don't know, re really odd, okay? So uh, I'll, sh I'll show you my, in the Marvel Studios version, Rocket erupts in a torrent of gunfire. Rocket, of course, referring to the raccoon, right? Hilarious, very comical, bright, Bradley Cooper, one of my favorite actors, voices Rocket. But man, he loves his automatic machine guns, doesn't he? Loves them. Okay? So, for as much as I love those films and those characters, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's a tricky thing. It's tricky, right? So, um, all right, who's got a couple? Let's just hear a couple of these. Go ahead. In the sports version, the shot means go. How about that? from an athlete on the diamond. I know you don't have guns in baseball. Alright, in sport in a sports version, a shot means go. Something like, you know, like the starter pistol on a track meet or something. What about you? In the Smash version, Joker's new special is gun. Now what is that? In the Smash version, Joker's So that's from a game, right? Okay. Let's hear a couple more. Marie, you got one? I don't like it. You don't like it? You want to maybe tweak it till you like it? We'll get back to you. Okay. Natalie, you got one? Um, in the Call of Duty version, the more kills is the better. The more kills, the better. Okay, and in the video game version, okay, there it is. I like it. Yeah, Matt. In the sports version, I would be the final child picked for the team. Now, that, that, was that sort of based on that couplet up there, kind of a little bit? Okay. Um, all right. I see what you did there. Okay. Um, let's hear maybe one or two more. Go ahead, Cassie. In the Beatles version, I would be John what? Oh my goodness, you did not just go there. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh my goodness. On that note, we're going to end it on that note. Okay? No, no, real. Um, she said, in the Beatles version, I would be John Lennon. <laughs> What a strange feeling I'm having right now. I'm like, it's like heartbreaking, but it's also warming my heart that you connected that in that way that you did. But it also breaks my heart at the same time. Like, <laughs> see the power of poetry, guys. This is the power of poetry. Okay. Does anybody else want to share theirs before we move on? Anybody else? All right. Okay. Good job. All right, so that was our poetry warm-up. Nice job, okay? This, this, is, this is good. Now, I think we're going to move on to a couple of our commercials. Uh, Colin, if you, if you wouldn't mind hopping back to the podium there. Can we to you? Yes, please. Yep. I can do that now. Just do it this afternoon or something. Oops. Uh, I am already signed in as that. Thank you very much.
Okay, let's, uh, so this was, this was actually a very famous one that came out in 1984. All right, um, let's watch it. Pretty nice job there. That, that's nice, visually very appealing. Let's watch it first. some gaps as needed, but Colin, tell us about this commercial, okay? Okay, so some of the big nouns in the commercial are sledgehammer, big screen, and she's wearing a Macintosh computer outfit. It's kind of hard to see, but it's a computer on the shirt. And the outfit also speaks to what about her? What, she's what like, she's a computer, I guess. Okay. Right? That's what I thought. The setting is a big brother society where the government brainwashes people by withholding information from them. And here in the advertisement represents an Apple computer, and the sledgehammer that she is holding represents Apple releasing information to the public and breaking everyone free from being brainwashed. Okay. Now, that's great. Um, when you say a big brother society, see how he says big brother society? What do, you, what do you mean by that? What is your guys' understanding of big brother? I know it's an expression that you've heard before. Isn't it like almost futuristic, but also... Kind of like, like you know, in that one book, The Giver. Yes. That would be like a big brother society, right? In what, like, what sense? What? Definitely um, futuristic, but with what kind of tone to it? What? Kind of dark because the government kind of controls everything. Okay, dark because the government controls everything. All right. Yes. Marie, you wanted to add something? I was going to say they call it Big Brother because of the TV show. Well, I think they named the TV show after Big, the Big Brother was already an expression. Yeah, they named the show after that. But that's a good point because you were probably like seven years old when Big Brother first came on or something. You know, yeah. that's okay. Um, all right, and they showed right, and we'll, we'll, we'll let Colin get to it. Um, one, more, one more thing about the character. You know, she's clearly an athlete. You know, she's running like she's almost like a track. Like Stacy would be running track or something. Kind of reminds me of that, right? Uh, she's carrying like this cool hammer object, which Marvel fans, who does that remind us of? Thor. Oh. Uh, right. <laughs> Why does she really stand out? What are a couple reasons she really stands out? She's got a lot of color to her, whereas everything else is black and white drab. What else makes her stand out? Well, the sledgehammer, yes. Nailed it. She is the only woman, and there's like all these sort of faceless men that are gray, white, drab. I was also going to say they didn't really define her. You're saying they did not define her femininity? No. How, how do you mean that? Like, she wasn't defined by her femininity? I don't, I don't know. I mean, what's it kind of a feminine that dress feels like those feels like That is great. You guys are coming up with some real great stuff here today. You yes. truly are. I love that you said that. You know, especially in, they could have, you know, women in commercials in the 80s, you know, 
you just laid it out, dress, lipstick, heels, that type of thing. And this woman runs in here representing a new way to look at something that we're, we're used to putting women in that box in the 80s and before. But now we have this new, colorful, active, vibrant, athletic woman just charging in among all of these men who are all sitting completely passively still, right? As they are being brainwashed by the message on the screen. Okay? Do you remember what, we can watch it again if you like, but do you remember what the, the, the face on the screen was saying? What was the, ge the general message of the face on the screen? We will prevail. Do you recall anything more about what the person on the screen no. said? Just kind of like, kind of like background noise to me. Okay. Yeah, he said something about, let's make sure we get this. something about we are one people with one will yeah so what is this person trying to crush in the culture it, there it is okay and, and you see by the look of the people how they all look the same they're crushing the individuality now Colin back to you why would Apple present this scene what are they trying to say about their about their product Make everybody individual. Ha. Okay. Which is kind of funny, right? Because they want everybody to buy, run out and buy their product, which will make them not individuals. Okay. It'll make you stand out. Okay. I mean, it'll give you the ability, yeah, to express yourself in your own way, right? This is the theory. Okay. Great. Let's go on with your with your slides. Okay. Great. I uh, said this commercial utilizes pathos to frighten people with the idea of a Big Brother society making people think they need an Apple computer to avoid this type of society in the future. Okay. Definitely using fear, right? Absolutely. Nice job. Uh, pathos being an appeal to emotions, as we've said. And the woman running in is almost like our savior, you know? Like, yeah, and, and she's dispelling this fear. You know, she's uh, eradicating the fear. Uh, the target audience was families, businesses, schools, and the general public. And the prime And if not, go ahead and fill it in. starter that I want you to work on in the next 20 minutes or so. Why don't we send it straight back? Straight back. Straight back, Cliff. Brian, straight back, please. Oh, you know what? Oh my goodness. Um, I forgot to cut these in half. <laughs> Let me have these back. Okay. Yeah, yeah, let me have them back. Uh, yeah. 
It's all good in the hood. It's all good in the taken in 1925, okay, which, okay, 1925, guys, happens to be the exact year that The Great Gatsby was published, 1925, okay? And just about the time that you guys are wrapping up college, there's going to be the 100th anniversary of the publication of The Great Gatsby. Okay. Uh, so that's kind of exciting. Are we going to celebrate? So, uh, okay. And, uh, Top Hat and Gentry watch farm workers laboring in a field, 1925. Okay, so you might wonder what gentry means. Okay, uh, let's just look it up. Okay. People of good social position, specifically the class of people next below the nobility in position and birth. So if you were in England, you would be like it means that you like have you know your upper class privilege. Look at the look at these synonyms. Upper middle class. Yeah. Oh, privilege, well, wealthy, elite. High society establishment, the hot monde, whatever that is, sounds French, right? The smart set, uh, upper crust, jet set, beautiful people, creme de la creme, the top drawer. Okay. All right. So, uh, what you see. All right. On your activity, guys, you see um, a couple of bubbles, let's call them, like in the spirit of comic books, which, and by the way, you know, tonight is a, a very, very huge moment in my life. Um, when I was like seven or eight years old, uh, I, have, I have a brother who's 12 years older, you know, and uh, he had in the basement a stack of Marvel comics from like the 60s and 70s. You know, and I was a little kid in the 80s. So these comics were already old, and they already had that old comic book smell, and you know, they were in various conditions. Some of them were all like, you know, tattered up, and some of them were in pristine shape. And, um, and I, that's how I fell in love with reading, and my imagination started to blossom at that young age because of Marvel Comics. So tonight, is not only the end of an 11 year story arc of films, it's also a culminating point in my entire life from when I was that little kid. And it's time for the big end game scene. So, do you know the difference between those two types of bubbles? Yes. The hard edged one and the soft bubble one. Saying and thinking. Exactly. Right. 
I want you to fill in. Okay. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Has anybody in here ever read this book before, The Great Gatsby? You have read it. Okay. Was it like half, half of it? Is that for school or just on your own? Or? On your own. My brother was reading it. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm just curious, out of curiosity, you stopped halfway through, just wasn't grabbing you, or you got sidetracked, or I got sidetracked. Got sidetracked. Okay, all right. Uh, no, nope, that's great. I appreciate it. All right, now another question: How many of you have seen a film version of this? Okay. Yeah, yeah there's like there's three Leonardo modern DiCaprio. versions. There's a 1974, a 2000, and a 2013. I think was the last one. That's the most recent one. Okay. Now. Most of you probably don't have much of a sense of the book, having not read it, or maybe you saw the film and okay, maybe you haven't. Let me ask you, based on that cover, do you want to make any, what, what kind of book do you think it's going to be based on the cover? This is New York. Why do you say New York? Oh, lights. Okay, so you see buildings and bright lights and you think of New York City. Okay. Brian says Vegas. Okay, that's an interesting that's an interesting alternative guess. Does anybody does anybody want to give us a historical reason why Vegas would not be it didn't exist as we know it in 19, yeah, 1925 it didn't exist as we know it. It was just uh, and I'm quoting the, I'm quoting the Godfather. It was a, a desert stopover for GIs on the way to the West Coast. Okay. Yeah. That, that's exactly how the guy says it. Yeah. You say Jersey. What makes you think of New Jersey? Oh, you're pulling out the F. Scott Fitzgerald bio biographical information. You went to Princeton, you say. Yes, you did. He did. Um, and also, like, Atlantic City was a big sort of, it had, like, a, almost looks like, what does that look like? Ferris wheel. Like a Ferris wheel. Now, who's familiar with the New York City? Coney Island. Coney Island is correct. You got it. Coney Island. Very good. What about this top part? Just some lady. Okay, let's start there and we'll work forward. Is she Gatsby? Say it again. Is she Gatsby? Is she Gatsby? She's not. It's a name of a character, yes. So you're, okay. That's fascinating how yet you can't tell the gender from the word Gatsby. That's kind of interesting. Is it a well, well, we'll find out, won't we? We shall find out. That's a yes. Well, I'll give you a, I'll give you a clue. What's the last letter in Gatsby? Why? Think chromosomal. Chromosomes. Tell me why. There's your answer. Okay. What? What's with the face? Expressionless. Expressionless. Did you say expressionless? Yeah. When? No notes. Is that what I'm supposed to do? Okay. <laughs> expressionless, no nose. Is yeah, that what you say? Is that like under the eyes that's supposed to be there? That yellow thing. Okay, what does it look like? It looks like a tear, doesn't it? Now in this particular rendition, it looks almost like a green slime or acid color. Uh, I'm not sure because if you look at my edition, it looks like a firework going up. My edition, uh, it's a lot whiter the tear, and then sorry about the lighting, but the tear is a lot whiter. Um, yeah, like neon. That's good. The brightness. And what do we know about neon? What kind of light is neon? Zeno. I like that. We were just outside, in a one, and I brought my camera because it's a wonderful source of what? Bright light. What kind of light? Bright Natural light. light. What kind of light is neon light? Electric. Neon. It's electric. Unnatural or 
What? Artificial. Artificial. Okay. Now, think about this. An expressionless face crying a potentially artificial tear. Think about that. Let, let that sink in a little bit. Okay? Um, there's no real sense of emotion on the face, and it lacks a nose. Remember that. Okay? What do we associate noses with? Smell. Um, where in the animal kingdom are noses especially more pronounced? Dogs. Where else? Bears. Elephants. Anteaters. Okay. So the nose is a very visceral sort of like of the earth, of the soil, of the animal kingdom type of a construction. We have and it's sort of a dreamlike, like it's like this face hovering in the night sky, almost as if somebody is what? I N G. Somebody is blanking that face. Dreaming. Dreaming it. You are destroying today. You are. <laughs> all right. Keep all that in mind. Those of you who have, who, those of you who know the movie, have seen the film, you sort of can get a sense of what I'm driving at. If not, get ready for like one of the most heartbreaking love stories. It's, but there's so much more to it. It's more, it's so much more than that. Like if you subtract the nose from the equation of eyes and mouth, it kind of makes it like anonymous. An anonymous. Yeah. Interesting. So you're saying that the nose really gives. Uh, pronounces a person's appearance. Yeah. But removing the nose, that's very interesting. Yeah. Wow. Reminds me of Mr. Potato Head. Remember those? It, it does remind us a little bit of Mr. Potato Head going on there. Uh, okay. So that's just a little uh, pre thinking about that. Now that we're all back from the fire drill, back to this image. Oh, yeah. Let me pull up the camera version. <laughs> I would like you guys to, to write down what do you think the wealthy elite would be saying out loud? Just speculate. What would be natural for them to be saying? Okay. And then what would the working class people all bent? See that guy bent over there? You know, it's symbolic of his back is bent with the, the, the burden of his work, you know, that type of thing. While these guys stand straight with their canes and their hats, all straight lines. And the workers are crouched over and bent. You know, like there's a lot of, lot, lot of happening in this photo. Um, what, would, what would make sense for them to be saying? But then what would make sense for them to be thinking? Now, why do you suppose I did it this way? Why do you suppose I, I put these guys saying it out loud and over there just thinking it? Go ahead. Go ahead. What's that problem? Because the people on the left can't really say what they want to. Why can't they? Yeah. You're right. Why can't they? Because the people to the right are like over and over. Over and over. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, they're the waistcoat crowd, right? They're, they, they fling their, their tuxedo tails wherever they want, and they, they don't necessarily care about the ramification. You know? So... Um, now, you can fill this in. Maybe they're talking to each other. It kind of, kind of almost makes more sense that they would just talk to each other. Why does that make more sense? Because they wouldn't go outside their social group. Okay. They wouldn't go outside their social group. From, from the mouths of babes, as the Bible says, or from the mouths of children shall come wisdom, shall come the truth. Okay, remember that. Remember what she just said. Okay? Um, what'd you say? The old sport. Okay, so you definitely have read some of it. Um, so they're probably going to be speaking amongst themselves to stay within their social class. They're not necessarily going to be addressing, you know, unless they're barking orders, but they don't seem like the type to bark orders. They seem like the type to hire people to bark orders at them. You know, so they're going to be removed by a couple of uh, degrees of separation. 
you know? So fill that in with a couple, go ahead and do that now, okay? Go ahead and do that if you would, okay? Maybe a little more, okay? Stretch it out a little bit. Stretch this, stretch that out a little bit. See if you can come up with, what would make sense for them to say? Did you not get one? Okay. Done, you can sort of hold it up. Cool. Thank you. Con, are you feeling done there? Or you got another minute? You know what? <clears throat> About six or seven or eight of you are still writing. That's that's great. Keep it going. I just sort of want to. Um, could you turn the bottom light on the switch for me? The, the bottom switch. Okay. Yeah. This this camera works a lot better with light. With light. Thank you. Uh, great. Thanks. Matt, were you done with yours? There? Can I have to do it? some of these. They should be working harder. How's the family? We work hard, but they get the recognition. They have it easy. Must be miserable to not have money. Can't relate. I work harder than all these men combined. You are not working hard enough. I would like to see those guys work this hard. Haha, okay. -ha. look at them sweat. These gentry, and actually you could you could refer to them just as gentry actually works plural as well. The gentry are known for their wealth. These gentry don't know anything about hard work. Can you imagine being Paul? Sucks to be dead. Okay. Is this worth the pay? My back is killing me. Is this day almost over? Okay, yeah, I love it. Okay. Now this is funny and all. Uh, if I were being a real stickler, I would say, well, would these guys speak like that? Notice how I was, I was trying to talk all proper with I'm affecting, you know, the, the elite Britishism, the accent and all that. Um, okay. Look at those dirt schnapps. Is that the word? Did I say it right? Well, I just want you to read the bottom when I cross the other one. Okay. Down. Did you see the horse race yesterday? Man, 
it's hot here. My back. I'm hungry. Man, I hope I don't get fired. Look at those sorry boys working for almost nothing. These conditions aren't humane, but I have to work. Uh, see how I have to just go ahead and add that in there, and you're good to go. All right. Right? <laughs> these workers are too lazy. This job is so easy, and these workers still can't get the job done. Why do I have to work so many hours for so little pay in this blazing heat? Okay, good stuff. I wonder if they think we are going to help. Dumb peasants. <laughs> dumb peasants. Okay, yeah, I couldn't make that out. Why aren't those dudes helping us? Okay, okay. Look at those peasants. I wouldn't touch them. Dirty rich, hardly working, uh, sorry. Dirty rich, hardly working for their money, ungrateful folk. Make them work. Along this day, it feels as if we'll never stop. Thank God we do not have to do the dirty work. I wish I was as wealthy as those guys over there. These peasants need to work harder. This winter won't be as good as last year at this pace. Why do they tower over us? We're the same. What makes them different? Okay? These workers must work harder or we won't survive the winter. I'm working my butt off, but it seems we are lacking this year. If they weren't watching, I could probably do that. Interesting. Okay. All right, good stuff, okay? And everybody else, uh, just make sure you drop yours off, okay? Make sure you drop yours off. Um, okay. We'll get to these maybe at the end, okay? Or, or next time as a warm-up, one or the other. Um, okay. Uh, <coughs> Have I showed you guys this before? Yeah, I've seen no. it. I've not seen it. Okay. Seen it. All right. You see, in the first, it's four panels. You got a little glimpse of all four. Okay. You've got one guy in a perfectly reasonable car looking at another car. Look at that new car, right? Now, watch what happens if you go across. If only I could afford a car. And then, when we're done looking at this, I have an important question for you. I wish I had a bike. Now, what do you predict the next, the last one's going to be? What's that? Okay. He can go wherever he wants. Okay. See what's happening here. Um, what is here? Perspective is everything. Okay. Um, I feel like we've probably talked about this before, but it's funny how we're, let's bring all these activities together now. Let's pleat them together like we're making a, a hair braid or something. One of the first things we did today was we talked about commercial advertisements, right? We're starting each class with a couple examples of commercials. Did we talk in here about why are commercials so omnipresent? They're everywhere in our culture. Why are they everywhere in our culture? We talked about this. What do you think? Why are they everywhere in our culture, commercials? I mean, just you can just give us basic, simple answers to start. Money. What about money? money. Companies are going to earn money from advertising. Okay, it's a no brain Okay, um, why do we tolerate that? Why does that happen? Why is why is that perfectly okay in our culture, in our economy? Let's say they make it entertaining, and you can actually get information out of it. Sometimes. Well, that speaks to what we get from the commercials. Yeah, we get entertainment, and we get we get in, uh, information. That's good. Uh, why would an economist, a person who works with the economy and, and knows about the economy, why would an economist say that, it, that commercials are very important? What do you think? The people who are advertising and the people who are paying the people to advertise. Okay, all this money that's changing hands, what is that ultimately doing for the society? 
Okay, jobs, money is fed into the economy, right? Because what kind of what kind of a uh, economically speaking, what kind of a culture are we living in in America? What's that called? Starts with a C. Not communism, but the, the opposite. Capitalism, guys. Yeah, I mean, does that ring about right through social studies, etc.? Okay, capitalism is. The, uh, the system, the economic system under which, you know, people generate products and they sell these products. And the buying and selling of products is feeds into the culture and provides commerce and currency, you know, uh, and allows people to build skyscrapers and bridges and mansions and have libraries and museums and streets and schools and parks and you know military forces and you know like all sorts of things that we have we would call them luxuries we kind of take them for granted but think about cave times they had none of that the reason why we're able to build all of this stuff that we have is based on the generating of this capital okay Oh, you have this money now. I can build a larger bridge or a larger building, or I can make my company larger. I can reach more people. Oh, we can hire an inventor to, to invent a steam engine. And now we have railroads, and we can hire people to lay down the railroad ties so that our railroads can expand throughout the entire continent. You know, like, money built all of this, you know? So on the one hand, on the one hand, you know, it's, like, really beneficial and Productive, right? Okay. Um, what does it have to do with this? Why? Why did I launch into that based on this image? Okay. Now think about it. Capitalism, commercials. What do they want people to believe? Okay. So. That, that they want, always want the next better thing, that you need that new be next best thing. Notice that word need. Notice that word need, okay? Okay, do I really need an iPhone? What's the newest number? XR. 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 <laughs> well, I suppose I kind of need it if my 7 or whatever one that I was perfectly fine with still works perfectly fine, but if it's going to start to lag and glitch based on not getting the updates purposefully perhaps so that they'll make me buy you know what I mean so they work in their stop gaps they work in their ways hello welcome they work in their ways to make you buy the next product you know so all these people with the thought bubbles here except for the last guy right I mean are members of a culture whereby you are not meant to ever be satisfied. Think about that. You are never meant to be satisfied. Maybe when you buy that stick of gum or that new phone or that new car, you're like gratified and you're satisfied for the moment or for the week or for the month or for the year. But inevitably, the commercials, they, they nitpick away at you because you know, they sell a certain millions of units a year they move. You know, every quarter they, they measure their, you know, their profit margin, right? But they have to get you to go out and buy it again and again and again and again. So they, they flood your attention with commercials and, you know, it's, it's kind of ironic, isn't it, that I'm, I sound like I disapprove of this. But then we're spending all this time in class looking at these commercials. But we're doing that purposefully to get into, well, how are they structuring their argument? What are they appealing to to get you to go out and do this? Okay. Um, what does all this have to do with the Great Gatsby as we prepare to, to be done for the day? Okay. Um, well, tied in with the Great Gatsby is, you know, the thing about the Great Gatsby, it's highly considered to be the great American novel, you know, that expression. Um, the story of America is the story of 
dreaming big, right? And wanting more, all right? People could have settled the 13 colonies, okay, and been completely fine. They could have been, okay, we're, we're going to kick it now, we're going to chill. There's still plenty. There's still like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of like acres of available open land rolling through Virginia, West Virginia, Virginia, you know, down through the Carolinas and Georgia. There's still tons of available open land that people could have, it's, it's not like people had to take off west, but people took off west. Why? Why do you suppose they did that? Because they wanted that next best thing. What's that? Expansion. And what's another word that starts with E-X, P? Exploration, yes. Okay, when you get situated in a, a certain life, right, okay, now what? There's that, there's that sense of, okay, well now what? A lot of you guys, falls in high school, you're like, I'm feeling kind of done, you know? With the, I mean, it's, the weather's getting nice, you're feeling a little done maybe, and then next year, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm ready.